Hello, this is the third in a series of videos documenting the restoration of my family's TE Model 99B back to some of its original glory. In my last vid, I gave an overview of the various design blocks of the amplifier portion of the 99B and a detailed review of how the amplifier circuit actually works. I was thinking of giving a detailed overview of how the turntable mechanism works. However, that would be a very long and quite frankly boring video. It would be full of words like cam, actuator, push level, flip gear, filbert flange, etc, etc. I would have to do all sorts of complicated animations, which take me much longer than the actual restoration will ever take. So I'm going to give that a skip, unless there are a few mech heads out there uh, who really want me to do one, you can leave some comments. So without further ado, let's have a look at my vid of my first impressions of the app and its layout. Now the first thing I want to do is root through this and we'll go over the different parts. So I know this is going out to the turntable because I connected it from that. This is 120 volts AC in, which oddly enough goes in through this end, comes across I think on the bottom, and then comes out to there, and goes back up in here into this transformer, which is a 220 120 220 transformer it goes into this box which you can select your your uh, voltage right now it's set up for 110 and you can also set up the 120 double double fuses on it draw on the schematic which I have right handy uh, let me get my pokey stick here so I have to stick my fingers in something there's the transformer which should be cleaned out a bit I'll do that next transformer with double fuses. This over here is a bridge rectifier. Who knows if that's good anymore. And then it goes from this main transformer into these two transformers and these are the left and right stereo transformers. So the main power goes from here. I've taken the tubes out and the two tubes go in here, here and here. So there's one amplifier on the left, one amplifier on the right. This is a on-off bulb, or just an indicator light. Eventually, I have to get inside all this little stuff. You see it's all point-to-point -point with one rail, two rails, and lots of little capacitors all over the damn place. Interesting pots on this, the two position pots. Up, up for left channel, down for right channel and you set them as you see fit. Same thing with this one. Left, right, balance. And then it's a simple on off switch. The switches are a little gummy, but they still work. So now that I got my bearings, so to speak, let's do an actual review of what I found out. First, I had the valves checked, though 90% of the time there's nothing wrong with them if they're not broken or cracked in some way. I don't have a valve tester myself, but I am a member of my local radio club, and just before the pandemic set in, I managed to get them tested by a fellow member. They both tested good, even after decades sitting in the attic and more than a decade of use. I also discovered that the club has a tube shack, so I was able to secure a few replacement valves, at a much better price than any of the tube sharks one can find online. So my first advice for anyone getting into this hobby is, join your local radio club. It's the best 15 bucks I ever spent. I did not video it, but I did do a simple continuity check on all three of the transformers, and they passed with no shorts that I could find. As you saw on the vid, the bridge rectifier is a sealed unit, and that's not easy to test directly. But I'm sure it's fine, as these rarely fail, and if it had failed in the past, I'm pretty sure I would see some sort of visible damage further on down the circuit. I'd already got the turntable motor running, so no worries there. The pilot light and its cover were long gone, as I only had the vaguest of memories of them ever being present. Well, it looks like it's another part to add to my unobtainium list. I did find a 6.3 bulb that just might fit, but they were $6 a crack, plus $14 shipping US. So I will have to figure out something for that later. The 50 microfarad twin can electrolytic was discolored and was just beginning to leak out some of its guts, so that one is toast. I guess the temperature gradient in the attic from below 20 degrees Celsius to well over plus 40 degrees Celsius was too much for it, so that one's going to have to be replaced. 
Though I didn't see any visible signs of damage or leaking on the smaller electrolytics, I really don't see how the small ones could have survived if the big one was decaying. I could try and reform them once I get them out, but I noticed there is no way for them to vent except like this. Not a mess you want to clean up in your lab. So I think I might as well replace those as well. The real problem is size. They are quite small in diameter compared to the similar value axle lead caps I've seen. Getting ones that fit might prove to be tricky. I guess we'll have to add these to the list of unobtainium parts as well. I will definitely have to swap out that two-prong plug for a three-pronged, just to be on the safe side. The tone parts were fine, as were their switches. The on-off switch and the volume control was okay, but it seemed a little sticky. I'm going to have to give them all a good cleaning of some deoxit when the time comes. Now we come to the crystal pickup cartridge. Well, that one's just an unknown. Those are known to just die with time. I'll have to see once I get the amp up and running. Finally, there are all the other caps. I found two types. One like these, which look like paper caps, but I'm not too sure, as they are fairly small and, and are not sealed with wax. Then there are these small caps, which may be polystyrene. I spent a little time looking them up, and I found that the paper-looking ones were actually very early foil caps, and the other ones, as I thought, were early polystyrene, so perhaps I do not have to replace them. So I got out my Mr. C cap tester and went to work. Goody. So, paper definitely. Five volts, give her a test. Ah, it passes. Let's see how leaky it is. Aha! Yeah. Huh, passes that, so it's not actually a leaky cap. But do I want to keep it? Okay, I put my can forecast. And it stays right there. This is a brand new 33 nanofarads. It doesn't even fit in there. Ugh, let me close. Turn that off. Just as a comparison, here's a brand new one. Doink! Don't even see it go. And mica. Right away. So, that tells me that is a piece of crap. So, you see, I was quite surprised to discover that some were not electrically leaky. I also did a check on their capacitance value. And any of the ones that did pass the Mr. She test were well over twice the rate of capacitance. So I have my doubts about them. As you saw in the video, they, they do take a while to pass the forecast test. While the new ones passed in an instant. So, out they go. Now back to my unobtainium electrolytics. Where am I going to find ones that are going to fit? It did take a lot of searching, but I eventually found axial caps that should do the job. As a matter of fact, they were even a little smaller than the originals. I did not find these by searching any of the major part houses, despite spending lots of time going through inventory pages and searches. Eventually, I tried many a Google search using variations on value, size, and lead type, but still nothing. It wasn't until I added audio into the mix that I got a hit. This was the data sheet that I found. Of course, none of these were stocked by the big online retailers. I did find some at one of those boutique audiophile online shops, but I wasn't going to drop 30 bucks a cap. I went for broke and clicked one of those live chat links. After about two or three chats back and forth, Found out right away where to order and how to order them up. Seems there was no extra cost for this special order. I just had to order a minimum quantity of five per value. They weren't cheap, but nowhere near $30 a pop. I still had a little sticker shock when I saw the final tally for just the electrolytic caps on this project. And with all the extra caps, my part drawers are beginning to fill up, which is a good thing if you're in this hobby. Now that I got all the passive component parts worked out, I have one little problem, and that's how to gain access to swap them out. In the clip that follows, you'll see the solution to that little problem. Uh, 
Now one of the problems with this, as you can tell, is that it's really compact. How are you ever going to get in there to work on it? Well, the German people that designed this were none too smart because it basically folds out like this and you can get at the whole damn thing. You have to unscrew a bunch of screws on the side, which I've already done. But you can take out the entire amplifier section by simply removing these two screws, uh, these two caps. With a little more access to the amp, I took the opportunity to check some of the resistor values. Most were on the high side, and only one was way out. That I've marked for replacement. Given that modern line voltage is well above the original 110 design, I think these higher resistor values are not going to matter very much in the end. As a final thought, I was wondering what would have happened if I tried to fire up this amp slowly with my variac before I took it all apart. Well, most likely it would have worked, but I'm sure it would have had lots of hum, as there would have been no filtering from the electrolytic caps. Anyway, just a thought. Now I have to wait for my electrolytic caps to come in. Stay tuned for the next installment, and don't forget to subscribe. Alright, ladies, it's too cold to do any work today. I'm just going to go back under your bed. Sitting there like a sphinx. Not going to help out today. Just sleepy.